Lantern, I am indeed coming to you from after extinction. Uh, but um, it isn't all that here. We exist in the margins, so to speak. Um, my talk is a bit long, but I've already found that people in Milwaukee have longer attention spans than California. So I beg your indulgence. Um, I'll begin with uh, walking backwards to the century I was trained in. In 19th century India, colonial anthropologists concerned with the collection and preservation of the primitive often spoke on behalf of the native. And that's where my first book took off from. But by the middle of the 20th century, authority on backward spaces had passed to economic development theorists such as Walt Rostow and Neo-Malthusian population theorists such as Paul Ehrlich, who reflected on the place of primitive economies, and this word was still used in the 1940s and 50s, in the larger drama of post-World War II development. And at the dawn of the 21st century, IT executives had displaced political economists. Information technologists then emerged as the new universal experts on global development in, in this century. So I'll illustrate part of this historical map with a couple of well-known historical markers that might bring alive for you the chronological claims above, picking for the sake of time today just the last two. The neo-Malthusian bioscience-based discourse of development articulated by Paul Ehrlich and the global techno-boosterism of Thomas Friedman will serve as sort of vignettes to remind us of this most recent transition. So in the larger project, which uh, Richard mentioned as part of a book, I track the mixtures, borrowings, practical consequences, and discursive overlaps among these historical trends. Now each is usually told in a different discipline, anthropology, does the anthropologist of the 19th century, development economics, does political economy, and technology studies, or its more practical cousin, ICT 4D, does the last. Each of these histories has been well chronicled in its own disciplinary framework. And my aim is neither to summarize, adding them up cumulatively, nor to produce another chronology of transition that purportedly models something called the post-colonial world. Rather, it is to make visible the themes and points of articulation among these discourses to show how each became thinkable only in terms of the other in a particular historical moment. Rather than modeling the post-colonial world, the point is to ask why and how historically it has seemed necessary to model the spaces of decolonization through science, technology, and economics, and what policies became thinkable via these modeling practices. So in the larger argument, which is too long to set out in full, I argue that their strategic connections become usefully visible via four key words, piracy, development, jugard, and leapfrog. And things that I will not cover today then, which are in the larger work, the explication of the various ideological strands of pirate studies, from the NSA to anarchist resistance, the arcane but fascinating economic debates of the development decades on which there exists actually a huge literature now increasingly considered obsolete. These are all basically the things I'm not talking about, but which I'd love to talk about um, in discussion. Um, but the following sections then draw from these uh, disparate, obsolete, and often hermetically isolated literatures and make claims that in the interest of time today will end rather schematically and telegraphically. Um, and when I conclude, I'll draw a new work on the political economy of development that questions the language of transition. Uh, although the normative forms we inherit from science, tech, and economics imply a temporal logic of transition, and I've used that word myself already three times, I use the historiographic method that Premesh Lalu quite simply and elegantly calls the cut. Instead of a disciplinary account or assessment, I seek a way of tacking between and among the histories of colonial science and the futures of techno-scientific capitalism. I'll begin then for real via two striking representations of India in a 20th century developmentalist landscape. In 1968, Paul Ehrlich's population bomb electrified the development world of the general public with its dystopian visions of a future destroyed by an overbreeding third world. Ehrlich opened his narrative by juxtaposing an experiential story of his family's visit to New Delhi with a scientific plot of population against time, predicting an explosive situation at the dawn of the 21st century. 
Science and subjectivity had come together in the crucible of post-colonial poverty. A red arrow in the middle points to the extrapolated population level in 2003. This is written in 68. And it exclaims, with two question marks at the end, carrying capacity reached. And this is a, a quote from his page one. I apologize, the red text was highlighted to, to emphasize it, but it's not very readable on this screen. So I'll read it to you. I have understood the population explosion intellectually for a long time. I came to understand it emotionally one stinking hot night in Delhi. My wife and daughter and I were returning to our hotel in an ancient taxi. The seats were hopping with pleas. The only functional gear was third. As we crawled through the city, we entered a crowded slum area. Notice the word slum. I'm going to come back to this notion of the poor and the slum. The temperature was well over 100, and the air was a haze of dust and smoke. This is a kind of heat and dust metaphor that's older. The streets seemed alive with people, people eating, people washing, people sleeping, people visiting, arguing and screaming, people defecating and urinating, people clinging to buses, people hurting animals, people, 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 people. All three of us were frankly frightened. But the problems of Delhi and Calcutta are our problems too. We must all learn to identify with the plight of our less fortunate fellows on spaceship Earth if we are to help both them and ourselves to survive and to fall. In the middle of the 20th century, we know as waves of decolonization, events and the accompanying complexes of nationalist, anti-capitalist, and non-alignment movements were to sweep over formerly colonized spaces, a growing Western fear of the post-colonial world expressed itself via a techno-scientific anxiety over the sustainability of modernization, progress, and growth. Sheer numbers of people, that's the people, 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 were seen as calling into the question, calling into question the very possibility of a future in a world seemingly spinning out of control after the end of colonization. The logical calculus of population demographics seemed to calm the panicked emotions of Western subjects adrift in the chaos of the decolonized world. Objectivities has seemed to trump subjectivity, predicting an outcome through the map that needed simply to be applied to current policy to avert the worst possible futures. And these are demographers who, who work out equations along the Malthusian lines of population and resources. Technoscientific rhetoric, therefore, seemed to offer a narrative that was less murky for policymakers than the explanations also circulating at the time, with the contradictory histories of settlement control, exploitation, cooperation among non-aligned countries, and resistance with whose legacies, in fact, post-colonial societies were wrestling at the time, or the unsettling open-ended questions about new relations between post-colonial subjects and former colonial powers. That is, there are these complex conversations circulating, and they're rich alternative conversations, uh, but it's Ehrlich's alarmist call to population control that rises to prominence in economics and development studies, articulating a scholarly rationale for widespread population anxieties. The emergence of Ehrlich's book as the voice of the moment was not inevitable, nor was it based on the absence of alternative narratives about the developing world. It rose to hegemony not because its time had come in some historicist sense, or that literally populations were threatening to uh, invade the earth. Rather, it resonated with and articulated the concerns of a strategically important state security apparatus and its enabling intellectual communities that include us academics. And it marginalized other less alarmist discourses, choosing narratives of competition and scarcity over other narratives of redistribution and diversity. So first world geopolitics in the 1970s drew on assumptions from the science of population, on the calculus of demographics, and on an equilibrium equation of danger and fear, leavened by pity for the plight of the less fortunate. When Ehrlich notes invoking a wife and child, quote, we were all three frightened, the words invoke the specter of 1857, when white English women and children were so famously threatened by the proximity of native bodies. The liberal framing of the concern that comes after this phrase comfortingly resolves uncontrollable fear into manageable pity. A fuller reading of this book's importance now would analyze this rhetorical move that is ending a terror-filled paragraph on a liberal charitable note 
um, in the context of ways in which aid programs in the 70s were building support for the idea that the transfer of development dollars to the developing world should require the implementation of population controls. But I want to pause this analysis, keeping this vignette at the corner of our vision while I center another set of historical images. The population bomb was a symptom of a larger set of international relations and public economic, uh, political economic policies. The investment and aid policies of the 70s were to hinge on the politics of reproduction via a panic about population and environmental resources. But 40 years later, in the first decade of the 21st century, an oddly inverted political economy emerged. The economic liberalization of the early 1990s had brought an apparent reversal in the state of post-colonial India, as well as its Western representations. This reversal was undergirded, again by techno-science, but a different scientific rationale. If the complex cultural and political challenges of first third world decolonization and post-colonial relations were short-circuited in the 70s by the science of population, promising a technocratic cut through the social messiness, delivering an equation among variables, fertility, GDP, carrying capacity, human bodies, and agrarian productivity, the complexities of the 90s are rendered again in technocratic form, but this time via the measures of computational network communication. At the turn of the 20th century, there emerged then a popular writer who, like Ehrlich, crystallized the concerns of global political economy and the promise of global technoscience into a dramatic narrative, Thomas Friedman. So I want to contrast the opening narrative again from page one of his bestseller, The World is Flat, with Ehrlich's population bomb. Separated by almost 40 years, each deployed different aspects of science and technology to carry their argument. Quote, aim at either Microsoft or IBM. I was standing on the first tee at the KGA Golf Club in downtown Bangalore in southern India when my playing partner pointed at two shiny glass and steel buildings off in the distance just beyond the first green. The Goldman Sachs building wasn't done yet. HP and Texas Instruments had their offices on the back nine along the tenth hole. The tea markers were, were from Epson, the printer company, and one of our caddies was wearing a hat from 3M. Outside, some of the traffic signs were sponsored by Texas Instruments and the Pizza Hut billboard on the way over showed a steaming pizza under the headline, Gigabytes of Text. Columbus was searching for hardware, precious metals, silk and spices, the sources of wealth in his day. I was searching for software, brain power, complex algorithms, knowledge workers, call centers, transmission protocols, breakthroughs in optical engineering, the sources of wealth in our day. Now, brand names undergird and punctuate the euphoria in Friedman's happy discovery narrative, where Ehrlich's fear-filled travel narratives had drawn literally on colonial tropes of heat and dust. Each of these above citations is from the first page of a best-selling book that deploys a particular techno-scientific narrative. Ehrlich and Friedman, both American writers in India, liberal social critics on casual visits, that is, um, sort of touristic, not with any historical or linguistic training, um, open their best-selling, world-shaping books with this touristic experience. So why are these touristic images so compelling to their readership? And what accounts for the changes between 1968 and 2005 that make each book and its Indian framing so divergent? The world is flat, which is a phrase itself that Friedman borrows from his unnamed golf partner, makes the argument that changes in late 20th century global political economy resulting largely from computational technology and its enabling supply chain systems have created different kinds of citizens. Carefully scripted for consumption by a new kind of US-based global actor, Friedman's narrative mixes classic colonial modes of representation, that is, for example, unnamed, faceless, multitudinous third world subjects threatening to take our share shadowy mutant supply chains forming terrorist networks, and contrast between good, hardworking, westernized natives and bad, violent terrorist natives, Friedman as Columbus, and so on. On the one hand, contrasted with practical advice for worried Americans, assuring them that they can still do well if they learn how to leverage the new global situation. The world is flat forges historical continuities as well as ruptures with the population bomb, each symptomatic of the underlying shifts in the role of technology and science between 1968 and 2005. In continuity with Ehrlich, Friedman's descriptions of Indians in public places deploy conventional nature metaphors. For example, um, in contrast to the swarming imagery Ehrlich deploys, 
Freeman favors a water image when he describes himself standing in the manicured corporate campus of Infosys, quote, observing this river of educated young people flowing in and out, end quote, although his, quote, mind kept telling him that this scene was simply a picture of the political economy of comparative advantage, his I kept telling him something else, quote, oh my God, there are just so many of them and they just keep coming wave after wave, end quote. Like Eric, Friedman allows the reader a candid moment of insight into his own emotional panic. At the sight of waves of them, an older narrative of fear at the seemingly unstoppable, undifferentiated masses of the developing world seems to reassert itself. But these masses are educated rather than unwashed, as they were 40 years later. Friedman observes that, quote, they all looked as if they had scored 1,600 on their SATs. That is a perfect 800 on verbal and mathematical, putting them in, all of, in the top 1% of test takers, echoing, of course, the model minority stereotype common in the U.S., in which Asians, through a combination of seemingly inherent mathematical ability, along with a seemingly inhuman ability to practice drills and rote learning, consistently seem to break the curve on aptitude tests. Friedman, like Eric, allows us to follow him through this panic, subsequently coaching us into accepting a new version of the we are all on the same spaceship narrative. Population control was the soothing solution in the 70s, and reviving the creative classes, managing the global outsourcing economy through the savvy design and management of technology are the 21st century solution. If the latter sounds more complicated, that's because it is, and I'll get into that in a bit, but I just want you to keep these two senses of the rhetorical continuities. There are so many of them, and we all need to live in the same spaceship. That is, we all need to exchange globally in the same marketplace. That's going to be a link to the next section, which will in initiate, rather than a close reading, as I've been trying here, a series of abrupt shifts that bring together the things that I'm hoping to link together for you. Uh, but just a, a couple more uh, minutes on Friedman um, and thinking of him with Ehrlich. So population control technologies had originated in Western research labs and population theories were disseminated in the 70s by Western aid agencies. Later, they were taken up by developing nation states. So uh, it's important to recall, for example, the Indian state's marketing of birth control and the subsidizing of sterilization and abortion procedures, often pushed by the state in the 70s and 80s. Computer technology, on the other hand, was difficult to centralize in the hands of Western states and aid agencies. The birth of software development in contexts of extreme sharing, such as the MIT lab environment that produced Richard Stallman and the free software movement, and the rapid adoption and modification of new software through networks of piracy in low-income contexts, like India's student population in the 80s, uh, what's often not acknowledged is all of the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs that came over in the 80s were educated on pirated software. You couldn't have had the California boom without piracy in the end of the 80s. Uh, followed by the global rise of open source software development through the turn of the century meant that the realms of use and innovation were radically decentered and dispersed from their inception. The science of population had seemed to offer a clear method of application and resolution of the population crisis. But computational technologies radically dispersed addition, modification, extension, and expansion depended on its being released from central control, even though its origins, of course, were in DARPA and related um, centrally controlled apparatuses. And this meant that it couldn't, for commentators like Friedman, it couldn't directly dampen the kinds of anxieties they were having about centrally controlled policy failures. Part of the success of Friedman's mode of research and writing is that he simultaneously gives a voice to an anxiety about globalization, the vertiginous feeling a subject experiences when the belief that he is at the center of a controlled process turns out to be based on unpredictably shifting foundations, and prescribes an antidote to it. Pop social diagnoses that seemed to articulate a new mal had circulated widely in U.S. popular discourse at the turn of the 20th century. So we remember the decline of American exceptionalism, the death of the American dream, the fear of technological excess, the decay of the nuclear family, and most importantly, the fear of being outsourced or bangalored. So early analysts of globalization had identified similar anxieties as afflicting Western observers. For instance, Frederick Jameson has commented on the ways in which global capitalism perplexes nationalist paradigms. 
Manuel Castells, in his three-volume work on the network society, famously extended this idea to suggest that an epical change in the nature of identity was resulting from the network effect, which was replacing, he claimed, centralized local identity formations. But Friedman's success was in observing and experiencing with his reader the anxieties about America losing its central role in global economic affairs, and then pulling the reader back from the brink of despair with a narrative that looked like a Cold War story that was reassuring because we had won the Cold War. Um, and that, this had a critical new element. That new element was technology, which thus appeared as the cool but unpredictable new thing which must be better managed and controlled. He articulated all of this as a challenge of citizenship, a challenge specific to this historical moment. And he says in an interview with, with Wired magazine, you can't be a citizen of this country and not be in a hair pulling rage at the fact that we're at this inflection uh, moment and no one seems to be talking about the kind of policies we need. He really wants this kind of centralized policy to get through this flattening of the world, to get the most out of it and cushion the worst. We need to have as focused, as serious, as energetic, as sacrificing a strategy for dealing with flatism as we had for communism. This is the challenge of our day. And this challenge, calling for energy as well as sacrifice, is precisely the challenge, I will argue, that Dugard and privacy appear, and, and, and piracy appear to solve. Each of these words, pirate developed Dugard and leapfrog, became a global buzzword at a particular moment. And if I had to place chronological markers on them, development would come first, defining the post-World War II global economic landscape uh, that was shaped around this moment at which many Asian and African ex-colonies forged a new sovereign statehood. Next, in India's case, would come the technological leapfrogging of the 1980s. Knowledge piracy begins to gain global traction in the 1990s as the talks around the World Trade Organization and the TRIPS agreements are signed, and enforcement strategies are threatened against developing countries that steal intellectual property. And in the future shaping spheres of design and business strategy, Jugard becomes a buzzword at the turn of the century. Let's take each one of these, and I'll become kind of more abrupt and staccato now in the ways that I deal with them. You all remember SOPA. Um, we all, this is the actual text of the bill, which I'll get into in a second. Um, these are the ways in which the protest went, um, went global. This was, of course, the Reddit site gloating that, um, that don't, don't mess with Reddit. Uh, for those of you who follow this, Reddit kind of spearheaded and... Uh, and uh, managed a huge and very, very decentralized kind of um, resistance. This was the Pirate Bay press release. They talked about Selva and Pipa, which were the, the two uh, um, bills that were put forward, um, and criticizing the kind of consumption and production that was being pushed. Now, uh, many, of, many U.S. lawmakers were perplexed. They really hadn't expected a pushback like this. They really thought that they could get this through without a lot of attention. Mm. There are many ways in which SOPA is framed, and I can't get to all of them. I really want to, to use only the West versus Rest framing, but I've been following debates around SOPA, um, and um, I'm really interested in why, um, why lawmakers were really uh, were surprised by this kind of outpouring of protest about um, something that was really about foreign infringing sites. Here's the text of Section 102, and I've marked in red, again, which is very difficult to read, Foreign internet sites. This is really the definition of SOPA. For purposes of this section, a foreign internet site or portion is a foreign infringing site if, and these are the actions that you follow at the bottom, against a foreign infringing site or the foreign domain name. The, uh, so Monica said, well, why are young American teenagers caring about foreign sites? On the one hand, this of course displayed the simple underestimation of the globality of internet experiences of young Americans. But on the other, it's a familiar strategic invocation of the American public as naturally consuming media produced only in America. So it's the status of this foreign infringing site that I want to take up in my next example that will make one of my several historical anachronistic detours for today. This time I'm going to visit a classic episode in the prehistory of pirate studies. So the Madagascar pirates of the 1690s are very interesting. There's a strong connection in the development of this pirate community in Madagascar to Mughal India, which at this time is one of the richest empires in the world, the Mughal Empire. 
producing enormous amounts of gold, silver, silk, um, and other precious commodities in the global market at the time. Uh, that was also in the late 17th century the growing power of the East India Company in the Indian Ocean. Um, and I'll summarize what happens here. Um, and for the next four or five slides, I'm summarizing deliberately from very popular pirate historians who are not writing academic stories. So keep in mind, there's lots of critiques of popular history, but I'm going to simply summarize in the interest of time. In 1693, a North American privateer, and these, these were the names used for pirate ships when they flew under private flags, literally often sanctioned by states, captured a Mughal ship. Again, one of the richest ships in the oceans at the time, it carried enormous amounts of luxury goods, and in gold and silver, over 100,000 pounds sterling worth of, of actual bullion. Um, they docked in Madagascar, and pirates from all over what at the time was the center of piracy, Europe and North America, all of these European and North American white Sea seafaring men, and that's important to know what they were for what's coming next, poured into Madagascar. Um, now, North American merchants had supplied them with economic support. Uh, there were North American traders who would set up shop in Madagascar, and they would exchange colonial North American products for the luxury items from the East that were captured through piracy. So the East is the wealthy area, and the pirates are coming from North America. Now, colonial officials in America were illegally, but knowingly, allowing this material to enter their ports without customs inspection, and some of them actually were investing in pirate expeditions. There was a huge demand for ships for these pirate expeditions, and North American shipbuilders could barely meet the demand for these pirate trade vessels. Now, East India Company complaints began, and they drew the attention of the British government to the Madagascar pirates. Oh, hang on. This is the East India Company petition that I want to get into. The company's problem was that since most of these pirates were English-speaking white men, the Mughal government charged the East India Company and the British government with acting in collusion with the pirates. Now, of course, the East India Company found it particular goal, particularly galling that it was American colonial corruption that was facilitating these Madagascar pirates. The, this actually leads to a short-lived but very famous pirate paradise, and this is why I said there's a lot of popular pirate history that extols this, um, and I'll, I'll give you a few points as I summarize the two things I find interesting about this story. One is how it creates this outpouring of utopianism in, in histor among historians, but second and more important for my purposes today is the threat to the state and law and order in unauthorized reproduction, not just the bullion and the, the wealth, but a certain kind of illegitimate copy circulating outside the reach of the state, but with claims on it. And for that, we need to get into the, uh, the um, petition. Um, but let me tell you about why, why I'm interested in the utopian society story. These are all from popular pirate sites. And you have a lot of sort of pirate gender stuff, which extols women pirates. Um, so I'll quote from Janice Thompson, which is again a popular book, Mercenaries, Pirates, and Sovereigns. According to Janice Thompson, pirates were more loyal to each other than they were to their country of origin, or to their religion, or even to their own race. Quote, this is a quote, Irish Catholics and Protestant Scots worked along each other without friction. Notice again, this is a white brotherhood. And the Madagascar Commonwealth was famous for its particularly successful utopian societies. Um, and in effect, a series of contextual transnational community ties were forged that was supposedly stronger than individual nationalisms. Now, the most famous pirate haven on Madagascar was called Libertalia. This was called a pirate nation. Their, mod, their motto was for God and liberty. And as a popular pirate historian, Cindy Valla puts it, the pirates who called themselves freemen organized themselves into groups of 10 pirates each, and from each group they elected a representative to enact laws, etc. And she uh, even talks about a, a rumored pirate socialist republic in Madagascar. Uh, one Madagascar captain is reported to have said, quote, they vilify us, the scoundrels, so when there is only this difference, they rob the poor under cover of law, force and we plunder the rich under protection of our own courage, etc. And you've heard this kind of pirate discourse the class-based inversion of power relations, etc. But I want to get to the second point, although I've spent a lot of fun times exploring the first. <laughs> but the petition. I actually would like to read this petition more closely. 
Um, this is the East India Company appealing to the British Parliament for the force of arms to be used against these pirates. I will expand some of this text so you can read it more clearly. This is just three paragraphs from the text. Um, so this is the request. Um, and they say, why, okay, so why should you bring state force against these people? Why does it matter that there's these people settled in an island, right? And they say, well, upon a general peace, multitudes of soldiers and seamen will want employment, or, and this is the line that's important to me, over time, the pirates will generate with the women of the country. And this is non-white women, and this is where the, the fear of miscegenation is going to appear. Their numbers should be increased. They may form themselves into a settlement of robbers as prejudicial to trade as any on the coast of Africa. So A, we have white men consorting with, with African women and numbers increasing of these miscegenated children. But that's not even the biggest problem. Let's get further. It's natural to consider, and this is a paragraph on citizenship and state claims, that all persons owe by instinct a love to the place of their birth. Now, these white pirates were born in Europe or North America, right? The present pirates must desire to return to their native country, England or America. And if this present generation, and I'm interested in the word generation, should be once extinct, their children will not have the same inclination to Madagascar as these have to England, and will not have any such affection for uh, England although they will retain the name of the English, literally they have their father's name. Consequently, all these succeeding depredations committed by them will be charged to the account of England. And I'm interested in accounting and how you charge a crime to a state's account. Notwithstanding that they were not born with us, right, so they're not born in England, so that this seems the only time, that is before they are born, to avert their births the only time for reducing them to their obedience and preventing all these evil consequences. Now, averting births is a key phrase in population control in the 70s. Fred Michelle Murphy's new book has a whole chapter on the language of averting births in, the, in Malthusian population control. And therefore, that is the rhetorical hinge on which, in the next paragraph, they move to using force and state power against them. Now, the threat to the British state, and it's, of course, at this time, shifting imperial ambitions, came from the generative moment in piracy. That is not merely the original theft itself, which had happened, but the generation of ungoverned, stateless copies. This generative moment was illegitimate. It was without sanction of the state, it violated class and race boundaries, and it spawned a tribe of half-castes whose actions would be charged to the account of England. The calculus of unauthorized reproduction is the hinge on which the call to suppression turns. The illegitimate copy then circulates outside the reach of the state, but with potential claims on it. Since they have the name of their father, they can make a claim on their father's land. The threat to the state, law, and order is embodied here quite literally in unauthorized reproduction. Now, Brian Larkin, who is someone who studies pirate reproduction in Nigeria, has argued, in fact, that the technologies of reproduction in the 20th century have a generative potential, and that's the word he uses, because they store, reproduce, and retrieve data to develop their structures of production, distribution, and consumption, both inside and outside state economies. So he says, quote, it is through this generative quality that pirate infrastructure is expressive of a paradigmatic shift in Nigerian economy and capital and represents the extension of a logic of privatization into everyday life, end quote. Larkin argues that in Nigeria, media piracy is, quote, part of the organizational architecture of globalization. Now, Larkin, like media theorists Lawrence Liang, Ravi Sundaram, Nitin Govil, and others, reject simple binaries between old and new cities, pre- and post-globalization scenarios. Rather, he calls attention to the critical role of infrastructures, which include buildings, personnel, railways, legal and financial frameworks, the movement of goods and people, and so on, which help us link old and new histories, colonial and post-colonial development. Technologies of reproduction then have the potential to generate new structures. It is this intimate generative ability of pirate production, distribution, and consumption that connects the threat of piracy to the promise of Jugaad, I'm going to argue. But in order to get to Jugaad economics, I will make a brief detour through its more stodgy ancestor, development economics. In 1991, India abandoned its explicit commitment to socialist planning, 
and under the guidance of a former finance minister, Oxford educated economist Manmohan Singh, it formally embraced free market principles and opened up officially to the global economy. Political economist J.P. Singh points out the technological basis for the new economy had already been laid in the 1980s, when Indira Gandhi's administration had shifted the definition of telecom from a luxury to a core sector. And this was important economically because as a core sector, telecom was now eligible for high priority planning expenditures and infrastructure was crucial here. At the time, confusion reigned among technology producers, infrastructure providers, the state and consumers. While technology had always been important in India behind the scenes to planners, that is influencing a supply side economics, it did not at the time have a central place in the imagination of consumers, that is, it was commonly ignored by demand side analytics in economics. But over the next three decades, technology's place was to shift radically in the rhetoric and, pla and practice of state planning, as well as consumer-led market changes. By the time the nation was marking the 50th anniversary of Nehru's death, that was last year, 2014, it was widely believed that technology had now allowed India to leapfrog over its legacy of underdevelopment. J.P. Singh explains the provenance of the, met the metaphor in 1980s model of technology planning. He says that it was used all over the place in the 80s, and it reflected the belief among policymakers and economic theorists that IT, especially telecom, can help developing countries accelerate their pace of development or telescope the stages of growth. This is referring directly to World Rasta. This results from the modernization and expansion of telecom infrastructure and in, in developing countries. The infrastructure in turn feeds into demand for telecom services by other sectors. By the end of the first decade of the 21st century, then, India's Planning Commission announced that liberalization had been a success, and the Planning Commission itself was shortly to be disbanded. In the 11th five-year plan report, I believe the last report ever issued, continuing the theme of the last, Richard, um, government economists couldn't help gloating about a business rating agency that had given India a, quote, business confidence ranking higher than the USA. The report summed up the state's satisfaction over the success of its economic policy, quote, contrary to the traditional fears that liberalization would exacerbate the scarcity of foreign exchange and make it difficult to manage the external payments, our actual experience has been a surfeit of riches. So I'm going to think of a surfeit of riches in terms of the fortune at the bottom, which is another phrase I'll explain in a minute. But why leapfrog then? Third world countries are commonly believed to have entered modernity with various lags. One is infrastructure. Narratives of infrastructural lack occupy a range of genres from travelogues that fear or celebrate third world travel, exclaiming at poor roads, decrepit transportation, collapsing bridges, and so on, to policy briefs that call for investment in, in infrastructural grids, telephonic, electric, or electronic. If poor infrastructures are commonly called on to account for the primitive conditions of travel and communication in the developing world, they are also at other times prime explanations for the sudden occurrence of leapfrogging techno miracles. This happened, for example, when Indians took to cell phones without going through the saturation of landlines that was common in first world telecom development. A narrative explanation shaped around infrastructures circulated in public discourse. It explained that historically one infrastructure, phone lines, had failed to develop in a timely fashion. But in an anticipation of the future, another infrastructure, cell phone towers, stepped in to erase the necessity for a stage-like progression of connectivity. Cell phone penetration in India and the creative modes of phone use by low-income populations was assessed by many industry observers as ahead of first world cell phone usage both in terms of percentages of population involved and modes of creative reappropriation. We could do a whole paper on creative reappropriation of cell phones, right? But similarly, to think about something non-technological, when Indians vote in larger numbers than is common in Western democracies, and the rates are still much higher, without going through the diffusion of literacy and political vocabularies that commonly precede voting rights in Western dem democratic history, the magic of Indian democratic participation is often celebrated in the New York Times. Here again, a leapfrogging of stages seems to have occurred, with polling booths and election infrastructures 
reaching out to even those people who had missed out on the earlier democratic infrastructural wave involving the spread of literacy, urbanization, and education. So leapfrogging in many ways confounds standard models of economic and social development that hold polit political participation to increase gradually via stages of education and national awareness. The person who takes to voting or to cell phones without the prior experience of literacy or landlines is represented as especially remarkable, like a child who skipped one grade and excels at the next, mastering calculus without first learning geometry. I'm going to go to Jugard, my next keyword. As I said, I'm just going to give these to you and try to stitch them together at the end in the interest of time. Rishikesh Krishna, business writer, says, quote, Indian's talent for Jugard, and I'll explain in a moment, is reflected in the ease with which we find our way around the myriad rules and regulations posed by governmental regulation, end quote. Rishikesh Krishna, who is an IIM, Indian Institute of Management professor, is doubtful whether, quote, this generation will transcend the limitations of the traditional Indian innovation paradigm. Envisioning a future India as it properly matures into economic liberalization, Krishna offers his book up as a blueprint for orderly and systematic progress in accordance with what he calls the scientific method. Now, this business writer, who has become very well known in the Jugard circles, continues a long discourse in India about illiterate, disorderly masses governed by a bloated, inefficient state. He situates Jugard in opposition to scientific tempo, arguing that Indians naturally practice, and this is one translation of it, creative improvisation, but are unable to follow the scientific method. So there are many definitions of Jagar, and I'll give them to you as we move on. One is it's the opposite of the scientific method. Quote, again from Krishnan, um, industrial innovation abilities in India cannot be strengthened without a more widespread belief in the scientific method, which underlies research and all forms of systematic experimentation, according to him. And he says, unfortunately, we are stuck in this old, unscientific form of innovation, often labeled as Jagar. Now, in contrast, a glowing article in Places, the Berkeley-based Journal of Design and Urbanism, by the way, this is all the praise that Krishna's book got. But this is Adelheid Fisher, who effuses to guard the Indian practice of, this is another definition, doing more with less. Making do is sometimes a translation. Could help frame a global philosophy for sustainable design and innovation. Fisher, like the artists and architects he cites, sees not only a business opportunity here, but a model for the survival of a species threatened by scarcity and extinctions. Indian Jugard, he says, can help produce subjects who can train the next generation in the art of Jugard. The capacity to live frugally yet richly, and here's an, yet another translation, in the coming age of limits. And uh, this is a film made, it's, it's huge, and the art circuit, you can go to art exhibits on Jugard and so on. Um, now, let's think about Jugard and piracy then in the age of the bottom billion. In research first published in 1998 and reissued in 2002 as a now famous paper, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, business strategist C.K. Prahalad wrote, Quote, collectively, we have only begun to scratch the surface of what is the biggest potential market opportunity in the history of commerce. In a very real sense, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid represents the loftiest of our global goals, end quote. Um, and this was published, note, by Booza Ellen Hamilton, the consultancy. Now, anthropologist Julia Eliachar has observed how this emerged as part of a late 20th century historical shift. After World War II and through the development era of the 70s and 80s, the poor in the former colonial world were objects of economic intervention. In order to be made proper consumers, states at that time needed to care and feed the most destitute among them and educate, uplift, and improve, these are 19th century terms, the poverty-stricken masses so that they could become consumers and citizens. But by the end of the 1990s, the poor had been tra transformed from potential consumers to potential producers, from objects of development to subjects of the future, from a drain on developing economies to the promise of regeneration for capitalists everywhere. State intervention now worked along with corporate initiatives and grassroots organizations. 
Eliezer sums up the transformation of the figure of the third world poor. Quote, they were not a group, oops, sorry. I don't have a quote. I'm going to read it to you. They were not a group of disadvantaged citizens of former colonies in need of aid. They were a potential source of innovation and profits, end quote. So the string of stories that reached us through the turn of the century, Hernando Soto and his scheme for property relations in Latin America, the Grameen Bank and micro-lending in South Asia, mobile banking in Kenya, all these are symptoms of this emerging bottom billion. Eliachar's background includes old-fashioned political economy and economic anthropological fieldwork in Cairo, but I'm interested in how she's articulating them quite independently the same thesis propounded by Bengali political economist Kalyan Sanyal. And this is a very long quote. I apologize, but his historical account is worth summarizing in the interest of time. Throughout the 70s and 80s, he says, the prevalent image of the informal sector within the development agencies was one of last resort for those who failed to find, notice the, the emphasis on failure in the 70s and 80s, failed to find a, a place in the formal or modern sector, of the space of the poorest of the poor who needed help. The view, th this view, which was called by economists the miserablest approach, was certainly consonant with the then prevailing idea of governmentality that sought to ameliorate poverty by redistributing income to satisfy basic needs. Remember, these were still redistributive states in the post-colonial world at the time. But this negative vision changed in the late 1990s. Instead of describing it in terms of deficiency and lack, international organizations as a counter to the miserablest image began to paint the sector as one with inherent creativity and ingeniousness. And he quotes a recent ILO study, uh, quote, the informal sector, this was in 2001, now stands as a potential provider of in, uh, employment and income to millions of people who would otherwise lack the means of survival, or as, quote, a breeding ground for entrepreneurship on a mass scale. And Kalyan Sanyal says, in sum, the discourse constituted the informal sector as an economic entity to implant it within the framework of development. So Sanyal argues this in a 2007 book, and it's based on decades of empirical studies of India's agrarian economy. Um, and he shows that the emergence of the informal sector as an object of study in the 70s was a critical intellectual academic event. Sanyal shows how the informal sector was discursively produced as an object of study by economists and anthropologists in the 80s following Keith Hart's ca classic study in Kenya. Reports and studies, quote, he says, declared the sector theoretically inexplicable early on, but then they began to, quote, constantly reproduce the informal sector, sorry, recreate and renew its identity by collecting, processing, and then disseminating information about it. This is still a quote. It is in this sense that the discourse has brought the informal sector into existence. Quote, end quote. Emphasizing the ways in which the informal sector came to be a subject in the drama of development, rather than an anomalous object to be explained away in terms of lack of fit with mid-century economic theory, Sanyal reminds us, quote, an important aspect of the constitution of an object of governance is its representation in terms of statistical information, because the statements made about the object derive their authority from the manner and style in which they are made, end quote. So what Sanyal is doing in this book is applying the classic methods of close reading and critical historiography, and he cites Foucault explicitly, and he's a hardcore economist, um, and the informal sector then in his, economy, in his account is made by a collection of statistical and anthropological studies of the poor. Academic recognitions of the poor as, as subjects of study helped in turn to shift policymakers as well as grassroots or NGO initiatives to uplift the poor. So the poor around the world reappear in the last decade of the century in these peons to their salvific potential. We can see a range of practices and theories from Hernando de Soto to C.K. Prahalad, who I just quoted, as symptoms of this shift. Jugard, too, I suggest, is a similar symptom of a new subject formation. It echoes the move in models of production and consumption in the post-colonial world, from bemoaning embarrassing failures to celebrating inspiring resilience. The bottom billion then and their disorderly, chaotic, precarious, resilient creativity are today being constructed as the salvific subject of our global economy. It is the generative capacity again of these formerly embarrassing unwashed masses 
as well as the criminal activities, I would argue, of the unwired low bandwidth pirates that point the way to our collective future. In a refusal of both Marxist and capitalist narratives of transition, Kalyan Sanyal writes informal production into neither optimistic futurity nor nostalgic past. The wasteland of precarious people, he argues, are our contemporaries, not our impoverished past, nor our future workers. Post-colonial piracy or the people of precarious bandwidth and legality are similarly not subjects to come after the digital divide is bridged. Pirates and the unwired are our contemporaries, just as the underemployed precariat are the conditions of possibility of India's leapfrogging 21st century takeoff. Pirate studies, and I include myself in this academic field, currently inhabits a moment of discursive and institutional transformation. The alchemical process that transformed base informal workers into the gold of resilient workers is poised to render the pirate as future flexible geek citizen. After having celebrated pirates as subaltern resistors, chronicled them as enablers of precarious but flexible globalization, and marked them as objects of study, we, technology and media studies scholars, have positioned them today just as economists and anthropologists did for the informal sector in the 70s. Pirates and Jugaad artists constitute now, if we follow Sanyal's model, the conditions of possibility to revitalize global capital, precisely because of their ability to thrive in the interstitial spaces of an increasingly uneven global capitalism. And that unevenness is not only in the post-colony, it's right here in Europe and America. Sanyal has more to say about the shifting ends of this story of discursive upliftment, but that will take us too far afield. So I'm just gonna sum up by way of conclusion. The two sides of the piracy study explosion, that is criminalization and celebration. Both construct the pirate figure as standing outside of capitalist circuits of exchange, that is either in violation or in defiance. Both analytic fields have obscured the discursive historical and political economic aspects of the production of the pirate figure. The underside of the post-independence Indian state's rhetoric of leapfrogging development is the story of piracy. Piracy does not stand outside of capital. In many so-called emerging economies, piracy is imbricated with the story of leapfrogging. Yet it must always be disavowed by official discourses of innovation and state-led progress. Eckstein and Schwartz, uh, this is a project I participated in, with their recent book, Postcolonial Piracy, introduced an important spatial account by going across the postcolonial world from Nigeria to India. But they didn't introduce a temporal element to the analysis of pirates. While their studies are, in, are careful and complex, a cursory reader might assume that they're yet again inscribing the distinction between North and South, West and the rest. This binary seems tied at a time when recession, immiseration, and symptoms of underdevelopment pervade Europe and the USA, when most of the world's new millionaires seem to emerge from India. It is the temporal and critical economic history that Sanyal gives us that can help us to see pirates uh, as emerging heroes of another global narrative. Neither criminal nor recalcitrant outsider, the pirate technologist and the Jugard entrepreneur seem poised to become what the informal worker began in the 1990s, the answer to future forms of media production and distribution. Postcolonial studies of pirates and informality then are not optimistic stories of the liberation of the immiserated masses from a past colonial era into the liberal future, which was a hallmark of early colonial and postcolonial studies. Rather, they foretell forms of global capitalism in which the post-colonial returns from margin to center, not as subordinated others speaking out, but as a forerunner of all our future patterns of work. So I know one thing you started off with was the kind of framing this in terms of technological progress that is typically seen as an evolution or something that is in transition, but you're also mentioning the idea of the cut. And I guess I'm wondering whether it would be safe to say that instead of a jump cut, where you yeah. move from one state to another, yeah. that this is something a little bit more like montage, where two things are kind of smashed together and we get something new out of that. 
I wonder if that's a fair characterization or not. Yeah, it's a great question. It's one of method, and it's sort of underlying the story, and I didn't sort of bring it to the foreground. Um, so here's what I find fascinating about reading the political economic literature, right? So the, uh, Roscoe was in the background of this. I didn't actually cite him, but he writes the stages of growth, and it's the model for post-colonial, post-colonial, used as a historical sense, post-1940s uh, development. Right? And, and Marxists are also using the language of transition, because to, to move from the colonial to a global capitalist, and in a Marxist system beyond that to socialist, you have to go through these transitions, right? Now, what Sanyal tells us is there is no transition, that we're not talking about a transition, but we're talking about, and to use the technical term, a reintroduction of primitive accumulation. And now we really need to get into Marx to understand this. In Marx, primitive accumulation happens in the prehistory of capital. You rip the peasant from his land. You know, you sort of, this is primitive accumulation. You literally take the land, the means of production, from the peasant. And now once you've got it, you can go through endless stages of capital. Because that ripping happens in sort of pre-figuring of capital. That needs to happen for capitalist transformation. Kalyan Sanyal says, this is not the prehistory of capital. This is happening constantly. This is happening again and again. So it's a cycle of production of primitive accumulation that constantly rips people from their means of production. But in order for capital to continue, and he says specifically the post-colonial world, where I'm arguing that it's everywhere now, um, you need to produce that thing which seems the outside of capital, but it isn't the outside of capital. It's sort of parasitic upon capital. He calls it the wasteland. And I think the metaphor of waste that you brought up at lunchtime is key here. Because waste is not the outside of production. Waste is both the product and the enabler of the next levels of production. And he argues that the waste, and if you look at the numbers on the informal sector, uh, five years ago a study said 90% of jobs all over Africa are being produced in the so-called informal sector. How do you call it informal anymore if it's 90% of new jobs, right? And he says this is not anything that's outside. It's an absolute enabler of capitalism. So literally if you map this on a map, it's not stages of capital. It's a constant circling back to that which we thought was our prehistory and a production of our prehistory as, a, as an enabler of the current moment. So it completely messes with the temporality of the transition narrative. I was thinking about the example of the, the Indian use of cell phones in the reclub. And there's a word that they use that they're using the cell phones without the literacy, it's not about literacy. And interest, literacy for me is an interesting concept because of, uh, I study video games and people who mod video games. And although they mod the games without coding, which so it would be considered without literacy, but they develop their own literacy, kind of literacy. So maybe. Uh, I don't want to spend like, a comment here about like, Indian cell phones and these literacies. That's, that's exactly right. And when, when you, you know, I'm citing from the political economic literature, so many of these words I use, like stages of development and literacy, are in their words. I completely agree with you. It's not, you know, literacy programs are a big, you know, thing that states do, the post-colonial states. And so they don't go through literacy programs where they learn the alphabet in whatever language and then go to school and pass their school and get a school leaving certificate. No, but you're exactly right. They're producing new forms of literacy. The SMSs in India and in multiple languages using one uh, script for another language, you know, uh, it's very, very common if you get a cell phone which doesn't have a script of your language. And India has more than 40 official languages and, uh, and hundreds of dialects if you can't everything. You're not going to have cell phones with all of those uh, script possibilities, but you can recreate one language in another script. And, and these inventions are, are all over the cell phone usage, absolutely, yeah. And also ways of, you know, the missed call, you know, calling when you don't have any money in your account and the other person calls back. All, all these ways of using the cell phone without the kind of standard stages of growth. Um, yeah. And there are people who just do entire studies on cell phone usage in India. Yeah. Yeah. I'm struggling a little bit to articulate what I'm thinking here, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, but it occurred to me um, comparing sort of the first and final phases of the talk that a lot of the language being, being used to describe this new informal culture moving out of it into something that's central, it sounded a lot like another 
feel-good story about, okay, this is how uh, these people are going to become part of labor as it's traditionally understood by the West, and everything's going to be fine because, really, they just want to work on things, and now we're going to stop pretending that they don't, and yeah. everything will be happy. And I wonder, insofar as that seemed like it was present even in the critical narratives that you try to highlight at the end there, if that's a problem for taking these things on their own terms. Yeah, it's a great question. This is the, the study, unfortunately, died soon after this book was published, but this is the debate that's raging among economists. So there's a, what I consider a fairly narrow debate within among economists over what kind of labor are these people or could they be? And Sanil has a trenchant line, my favorite line in the book, I don't know if I can cite it exactly, but he said something like, there are these people in the wasteland who will be knocking at the doors of wage labor forever, but the doors will never open for them. And he's actually argued that they will never become wage labor in the classic Marxist sense. And this is more than just the reserve army of labor argument that's been made in Marxist studies. He actually says, Capitalists need to have them in the state in which charity can sometimes be handed out just so they don't descend into complete starvation and then revolution. Or, or you know, there are sort of micro-entrepreneurial loans. That's why I cited the Grammy Bank on and, and micro-entrepreneurship. We do all these things to maintain just enough flowing down to them from the mainstream capitalist economy and just enough flowing back from them that we're getting really, really cheap labor and products from them. Um, you, can, you can look at prison labor like this, you know, we pay pennies and we get many of our products paid from prison labor. This is not wage labor, this, this is labor under severely constrained conditions. So I think uh, you're right that many of the earlier pieces that I cited critically are talking about how to manage the transition from colonialism to post-colonialism by taking this excess population and working them into a capitalist system that knows how to control labor. Um, there is this problem that's been talked about a lot in Marxist economics about what happens when there are just too many people that capitalism to absorb. And if you look at the 18th and 19th century, theorists are saying, well, you send them abroad. The, the work of imperialism is done by some of the excess population, the soldiers who go off in imperial armies. Also, the Malthusians will tell you a lot of the excess population was killed off by epidemics, wars, famine, and so on, right? And this is, this is explicitly theorized in the 18th and 19th centuries. When you get to the 20th, you can no longer kill people off like that. You have no more imperial armies, although the mercenary story is interesting. So this is the excess population that economists are not concerned with, and your question about wage labor is key to that debate. I just had a, I was thinking of the figure of the pirates, and I think at lunch we talked about how uh, in the early year of publication, and the, how U.S. publishers um, used the mode of piracy as you know, publishing British books uh, in, in violation of the copyright law that had been passed in Britain already. So there was a resistance from even within the within the halves uh, against formal reason. Or, or former nationality of this kind of you know, uh, the market in economics. The, and then you also have the figure of the pirate jugar and of that person who is on in the mode of survival. In, in some some ways that resistance is in the mode of survival. So it's one in the mode of you know, accumulation, the other in the mode of survival. Mm -hmm. How do we bring those two modes together and in the figure of the pirate? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, again, this is uh, these are almost exact terms that Sanyal uses. He calls it the accumulation economy, and that's the mainstream capitalist economy. And then the other he calls the wasteland, which you're calling the survival economy. And he actually says, uh, and this is what, what Lawrence Liang says about pirates, that pirates are doing this to survive. You know, with, and he calls them low bandwidth producers as opposed to pirates. He said, look, these, these are not the hackers who have high-speed internet lines in the door who are downloading. These are people with very low bandwidth, and that's why, for instance, cassette tapes in Nigeria and things like that that Larkin writes about are key, sort of taking it off the digital infrastructure, maybe at one location, and then transferring it through non-digital means, you know. So it's a very, it's a, it's a hybrid process. And um, 
I, I hesitate to push the survival too much, and Sanya also says, let's look at these people. It's not only subsistence economy that they're doing. They're often petty producers. They're often going to markets in urban peripheries. And there's something about this economy that's semi-accumulation and semi-subsistence. Because we don't, we no longer have pure subsistence in most places. And I think that piracy studies struggled with the same thing. The early piracy studies were like, you know, from, from the post-colony, were like, we have nothing and we're going to take it, right? And then later, it's like, well, lots of people with, with internet connections and can afford it, can afford to buy a movie, would run out of pirate a movie. So I do think it's interesting to go from the kind of argument from I will steal a loaf of bread because my children are starving, which has always been the historical argument about poverty, to why is there this large gray zone which we can't quite describe in the old terms with which we used to describe poverty? There's this great work on 18th and 19th century poverty by Mitchell Dean, who's a historical sociologist and working on Foucault, on the production of pauperism in the 18th and 19th centuries. And he actually distinguishes between, I think it's three kinds of paupers the completely incorrigible, unredeemable, you know, you just got to criminalize them and lock them up, to somebody who can be educated and brought in. And I do think there's like some parents, are, some hackers are fired by the FBI and they're reformed, right? We know those stories. Some hackers are threatened by Aaron Schwartz, is threatened with a lawsuit and he kills himself. So I think we have this spectrum. And yeah, if, if this was to be a legal project, I would look at the sort of spectrum and be able to map exactly the kind of accumulation to survive the story. I think that's, that's an interesting map that you could do that. Yes, uh, thanks for that talk. And there are a lot of different strands running through. So it's taken me a while to see if I can uh, untangle them. So I guess I'd like you to talk a bit about well, you know, a connection that I guess is implicit or if it's explicit, I missed it, between uh, the opening derelict uh, anecdote about people, 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 and this notion of the you got of fortunate God of the pyramid. And because initially, you, you know, the contrast, which I think is just really wonderful between, you know, Eric and Friedman uh, and these two touristic moments, um, I think that really sets it up. But fortunate the bottom of the pyramid isn't really Friedman's understanding. Is it? I mean, he's a whole different anxiety. But What's happened, I guess, in a sense, or I guess I just finished from here, you talk more about what's happened from uh, Eric being kind of just totally freaked out and turned by this, uh, the, these mobs, and then this kind of ability to uh, 
find a way. Yeah, so, so there are these periods to slums in India that they're just so miserable, but that's what makes them creative. So that's what happens to the poor between Ehrlich and Friedman, but Friedman doesn't know, because by then he's a superstar, he's writing operas, and I don't think he's reading the political economy literature. He's not even reading the business strategists by then. But the business strategists are quietly doing this, and again, this is a problem of disciplinary separation in our universities. Many times we're on the same campus, but we're not hearing this. So is Ehrlich's project not that informed by a kind of capitalist motivation? He would say it wasn't. He would say he was anti-capitalist. That's why I emphasize that they're liberal. Yeah, he wanted to say that there's a kind of kinder, gentler imperialism. Yeah, and you know, demography as an academic field was constituted by that moment. Demographers really thought that they were doing good things for the third world. Uh, you know, um, even even Republican governments at various points would support birth control for the third world, even while they were against birth control in the U.S. Right, so if you do global reproductive politics, you can see the same administrations having radically different views. And they would justify by saying the third world needs birth control for better lives, so we're just being compassionate. And this is why Michelle Murphy is brilliant. Her book really does a great thing on the third influence. So, but I think there's a lot more to say about the figure of the poor through this, these centuries. Uh, I, uh, and you didn't talk about this about Shukar in lunch. Yeah. And now I heard about it. Yeah. And we went a lot of the same word we had for the years and we were like the same word. Uh, what was the same meaning that the actor wanted to work on? Called the Yah? Like almost like the same meaning, like the king with glass and like kind of building a young. And, and, and it has like the same level of logic because some, some people like on the conservative side say there's a bad thing for the country in some way that because we kind of, we, we have the, this concept of like, the Brazilian way that we do, this, we skip, we skip, right, like, we have stages and like that, and yeah. that's a bad thing. Yeah. And I guess the literature I'm using in the arts and the anthropology, they use like the, like, the notion of cap cap capitalism, they say that's a good thing. That's yes, I've good. seen that work coming out of Brazil. Really, and have you heard of the anthropophagy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That would be fascinating. That's actually a good question because yeah. uh, in English I see people with anthropophagism, Yes. Yeah, I, I absolutely. That's why I argue that the BRICS uh, countries need a kind of inter dialogue to, to, to catch these phrases and arguments because we see them all over in slightly different versions. Yeah. And, and I have to, to, to add actually, like, a question. The idea is 
you know, the standard rhetoric, again, we teach this to our students at the humanity, uh, like the, the state goes from the welfare state to the neoliberal state. And this is a large story that obscures much of the details, right? Um, and actually, Julia Yachar, who's the anthropologist I cited, has a whole invective about the way that we use the word neoliberal in the humanities. She says we really don't understand the details of what's going on with the state, because neoliberalism seems to make people in the humanities believe that the state withdraws, or is absent, or is let off the hook, right? But in fact, no, the state is redrawn, and go gets into these kind of um, private-public partnerships. Remorse, absolutely. And the state, in some cases, appears much more powerful in conjunction with the corporate link and in conjunction with the NGO sector. Like, I didn't use that term, but in, in India, the NGO sector has completely transformed from the, you know, from the 70s through. I mean, you used to, in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, see people go to the NGO sector because they were radicalized, national body or people's war, and, you know, stuff like that. Somewhere in the late 70s, they get professionalized. Or you get schools like IRMA, Institute for Rural Management in Ireland, really sort of professionalize people to be like NGOs, to do micro-entrepreneurship, and who are essentially doing both the work of the state and of what we used to call charity, right? That's why I use the word alphabet so much. Um, so the state, private corporations, and the NGO sector are in this constantly shifting dynamic in which you can't pin down a precise equation or proportion. Each of them are enabling what is inevitably a kind of power over the poor in the last two decades of the 20th century. So again, I think that uh, some, if you want to say political science, one could do a whole study on simply ways in which the state enters into these relations. And none of it, this is Julia's point, can be described as one thing that we call neoliberalism. Julia argues that the term neoliberalism is so meaningless that we need to stop using it. Or I've been talking to somebody in the, the School of Business at the University of Virginia, Darden, which is one of the top ten business schools, um, and I excuse, excuse the language, I have to quote from her. She says, oh, you humanists are enthralled in the pitch goddess of the market. And she argues that we have this incredibly monolithic and simplistic notion of the market because we believe some of the rhetoric, and you're right, this is about close reading. We read these statements and we take them sometimes too literally. But she says economists and planners are very well aware that the market is not run by an invisible hand. We know the ways in which we manipulate and shape the market. That's what we do. That's what we teach our students at the MBA program. And she says, you guys, the humanities, are the only ones who believe this rhetoric. So, yes, I think we need, and, you know, thank you for that moment because I try to take close reading as far as I can go, but then also to bring in close reading economy that I can't go any further with close reading and constantly to tap between multiple methods. Yeah. Well, thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I actually am uh, wondering a little if one can push beyond Sanya from here. You know, to actually say that there is no transition because the primitive accumulation is a continuous process. Yeah. And I was actually thinking there's a long, long story here, you know, which starts from Marx, becomes fairly complex with Rosa Luxemburg. Yeah, exactly. And then comes to David Harvey, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact of primitive accumulation being an ongoing process yes. does not at all cancel out the idea of there being uh, different phases and forms of capital. And the minute one says different phases and forms, you know, one is implying some notion of, of transition at some level of abstraction yeah. and other, you know, um, middle levels of social formations, as it were. So I'm kind of worried about that. And I was also thinking that, and I've written about this elsewhere, so I shan't go into it, but, but in fact one could also tell a story of multiple transitions. Yes. None of which are completed in India. Yes. I'm talking quite specifically, and I've you know, written about that. So I, I actually feel that's one thing one might want to think about, and also one wants to think about not to cease thinking about the informal sector, the way it's configured, specifically, let's say, in India right now, as still an outside, mm -hmm. but one where there is a dialectic between the outside and the inside. Yeah. You know, which is the only way that one could actually tell this larger story which I have a stake in, yeah. and I think which Anish picked up as well, yeah. between the fact that, you know, 
improvisation can be for accumulation and for survival. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's a mixture because that's taken for granted. Yeah. That if there are two kinds, they will be multiplied yes. you know, across the uh, across the continuum. And so, so in that sense, Jugar, yeah, you know, which is being claimed by artists and economists at the same time. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. Actually, you're kind of reviewing, this is exactly how the debate over Sanyal is breaking down in India. Uh, and you can sort of track it in the EPW and things. People have written uh, against this notion of transitionless capitalism, insisting that there are phases and forms of capital. And people have uh, hardly debated the outside inside aspect of the wasteland. Right? And this is why I said, unfortunately, he died right after the book was published. And I think he really would have wanted to, you know, modify. But this is very much like, I mean, if you remember when Kuhn, when Kuhn published the structure of scientific revolution, all the debate is over whether extraordinary science actually happens in this kind of paradigm shifting way that he said in terms of revolutions in science, or whether science constantly has revolutions every other day that are never reported. You're constantly sort of pushing extraordinary science against normal science. And so there were endless debates over, because he said paradigms come once in a hundred years. I mean, he had the Newtonian paradigm shift and then Einstein, you know. Uh, so he, he, his revolutions were very rare, right? And other people said, what if it's all over the place? And to some extent, I do think, although I follow those debates with great fascination, I think it's sort of, it comes down to semantic differences in how we define transition. If transition is a phase, or if transition is a historical periodization. And this is the same debate we have in history. How do you periodize the Renaissance and the shift to the Enlightenment? And Foucault even uses completely different terms, classical and modern, instead of Renaissance and Enlightenment. Um, I, I'm not sure that I can resolve it for sure, because I, all of the debates I've read pushing them end up with a semantic difference over the meaning of the term transition. I love your sense of the dialectic inside-outside aspect of the wasteland, but I think that's exactly what Sanyal is saying in his description of the wasteland. Let me cite a couple more things. I completely agree with the line through those of both Lenin also and Harvey. Um, Father Chatterjee picks this up when he cites Sanyal in a footnote in one of his recent pieces. Uh, somebody called Patrick Nebling, who is a Swiss anthropologist, picks up Sanyal, but none of them go near this transition question because it's so arcane and almost unresolvable. But there's a couple of other things that have really helped me in reading. One is Julia Eliachar and Sanyal didn't know each other at all, and Julia is making a very similar argument about there's no transition to the Olympus of this whole version, right? Um, but there's a really interesting book that comes out of France in sociology in the 90s called uh, The New Spirit of Capitalism uh, by Boltansky and Chappelle. Really popular among European Marxists. We hardly know it in the US. And so I was in a reading room with some Europeans, that's how I discovered it. So Boltansky and Chappelle uh, are tracking French capitalism after 68. And they actually argue after 68, what happens is all of these bohemians and artists, going back to artists and economists, are in fact invited back to the table in long policy discussions. And they get to redefine capital in a way that makes capitalism sustainable with those rebels at the table. And they argue that there's a kind of kind of general capitalism with which the creative classes emerge as the forerunners of the new capitalism. So for instance, in Berlin, the way that all these startups are happening everywhere. But you know, Berlin is this place where they had enormous space, you know, after reunification, nobody knew what kind of been happening to Berlin. And they need to reappropriate the space of Berlin because it's a unique city the global urban landscape. It doesn't quite fit. And so, so these French sociologists, and they're empirical sociologists, like Sanyal is an empirical economist, that they actually look at employment data and look at which artists were at the table after 68. And it's just a totally fascinating book. Um, and um, let's see, what was the other book is uh, something that uh, Foucault cites in passing in the lectures, and it's Kelly and Delille, A Productive Body. And it's this very, very bizarre, dually written Gary and Dylan write separate chapters. And again, it's an argument about the body of the worker and how the body of the worker is written into shifting phases of capitalism. And even they do use that term that you used. Um, I think many, much of what you said is totally arguable within or close to Sanyal's framework. It may be, many people say that I stick too close to Sanyal. Most of the economists in India are 
take the point about his as important capital. I am still fascinated enough with the complexities of Sanyal's narrative to stay fairly close to him. I think that book is absolutely brilliant the way it brings Foucault into hard for economics. But I can be convinced that I'm maybe too close to him. But I'm not necessarily making an argument about Sanya. Yeah. You know, it's not really a question about... I think it's really... I mean, the, 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 what Dunsky and Chappell are too, are, are talking about an incorporative capitalism, right? And that's a story that can be told in the arts, after all, what happened to European modernism after the Second World War and so on. So uh, one is quite happy to think of, you know, perhaps Dugar is another version, a later version of, of that story. But, but what I want to actually, you know, what I'm wondering about is whether, you know, it's absolutely true that howsoever, you know, we humanities people might use the term neoliberalism. Yeah. It is absolutely true that uh, flexibilization, informalization, and casualization of labor are generalized now. And this is a moment where actually, the, you know, the empirical realities of the decolonized are hitting Europe, North America, you know, in a way that they've hit other parts of the world, like Brazil from the 70s, for instance. Yes. So in, in a sense, you know, this is completely true. So you're quite right to say that this is not restricted, you know, to India or, or whatever. But on the other hand, I think there is a way in which different state forms, like the Indian at the moment, are functioning, and, and the way in which they are functioning is that precisely these generalities of what happens with, you know, to labor and work with neoliberal policies is interlocking with the informal sector, so that there is a very sharp relation of inside-outside and a dialectical relation between the two. I mean, microfinance, yeah. quarter billion, yeah. Practices like commercial surrogacy in India, yeah. where the body of the worker is being construed precisely as one which can be held on demand, two or three surrogacies at the most, and then relocated, right? Yeah. So, uh, so in some sense here, I'm not at all sure if one can actually dispense. It's not, it's not a question of paradigms. It's yeah. a question of actually, you know, particular formations. Yes. Yeah, I'm totally open to that argument. I think one could uh, one could make the argument that somewhere between the 70s and the 90s, there are shifts in emphases in capitalism. Uh, and certainly he uses the term constitutive outside, and that would fit with your notion of the dialectic. Um, you know, it, it, uh, the, the wasteland is neither outside nor inside capital. It's a constitutive outside. It needs to exist for the accumulation economy to exist. So one would use also the notion of supplement, right? I mean. Uh, it, it is a supplement to the accumulation economy. Um, I'm not sure what's at stake, though. It insists, I mean, the Marxist notion of capitalism was so 19th century, and we do have a shift. And I think to, to write things back into purely into the dialectic restricts us, uh, in many ways, into the kind of versions of capitalism that we see. It's incredibly flexible and morphing now. Um, and, and I do think we need new terms and phrases, although I'm very, very inclined to a continualist view. I'm very inclined to see things in the 19th century way, because that's my training. Uh, and I think certainly in my first book I was using a standard sort of notion of the dialectic, nature culture dialectic. Um, but um, I really, it's very hard to periodize this shift if there is a shift. And um, although I would uh, absolutely use terms from both what we call neoliberalism and what we call Fordist or, you know, classic capitalist accumulation. Um, so I'm not going to, this is a huge debate in India, and I've tried not to come down on one side or the other, but you might be forcing me to take a position. That, and we, I'll take that under advisement. I absolutely agree that, that the theory needs to be thought through further. Well, thank you for your talk and questions, and please uh, join us upstairs. Uh, Continue this. Thanks. <laughs>